All right. I'm sure the technical team um, are still setting up the, the hymns of meditation. We'll switch to that pretty soon. But I'm happy. I'm very happy to see uh, to see uh, Mwape, Mwape Chiwe. Um, that should be a sister, probably Sister Mwape Chiwe, and she's Catholic. What an honor it is to host you tonight, to have you uh, join us. And I pray that you will be blessed tonight as we listen uh, from God's word. Many more people joining in and mentioning where they're coming from. Isa from Morocco, you most, most welcome. Uh, you are really, really welcome uh, here. And so I ask that you may invite friends as we soon get to have the message uh, uh, preached here. So invite those you care for so that they can join. They can join this platform. They can also follow us um, on, uh, on Facebook. They can follow us on Facebook. For those that have been here for more than one day, or if it's not your first time, I'd love to hear from you. How have you found the messages? How have you found our meetings here? Just type in the chat section and I will see uh, your feedback. Happy Sabbath to all of you. I hope you enjoyed your worship. I'd love to hear from you as well. I want to know if you went to church, did you have a church service at church or it was a home, a home worship? Pretty much here where I am, it was great. Uh, still online se services that we have are not yet uh, open for congregation. Um, but we look forward to the meetings again uh, at church. I worship from home, but followed Lusaka Central Church, both Sabbath school and divine service. Okay, Morris, Morris Mzamba, happy to hear from you. Um, before having baptismal class, with four people uh, over first time and late afternoon Bible study with my fellow church members at Huaben International STA Church. Great, great, Maurice. Maurice, where are you from? It seems you really had a packed, packed, packed Sabbath, like a wonderful Sabbath from the narrative that you have shared. I'm excited to hear your story. You can keep sharing your stories. I hear how you worshiped. I pretty much was in my apartment all day. Um, and we had a nice, a nice service uh, online, online from here. I'd love to hear from you. Are there any non-Adventists who have joined already? Please let me know so that I can recognize uh, your presence. All right. Could we have now the hymns of meditation, technical team? All right, all right, great. So we we will may not have our our hymns of meditation. Uh, we'll soon switch straight to our our sermon for tonight. But before that, I want to invite um, for a special feature from Tanzania. A special feature from Tanzania. Technical team, could you assist me? Have that possibility now. And then I'll be back on the other side to introduce the subject for tonight and the speaker for tonight. Special feature from Tanzania. Okay, great, 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 great. We will probably have 
all these things in the coming days. We'll have the special feature and great music of meditation in the coming days. Without much further ado, I will now introduce the subject for tonight and the presenter for tonight. Tonight, we ask again deep questions. Self knows self. The people can see all the good things and praises for the good things that they're able to see from the outside. But deep down in our hearts, when we search from inwards, we know better. And sometimes the burden of our guilty overwhelms us. And we ask ourselves so many questions. Whether there is hope, have we gone too far? Can we be forgiven? Is there hope for each one of us? Sometimes when we make an account of our lives, these are the realities that we see. And the burden of the sins that we carry could well overwhelm us. And so tonight we seek from the word of God answers as to whether there could be forgiveness for our sins. And it's a great privilege that we have a man of God to speak to us tonight, a great, great speaker, a man I have come to love for his preaching of the word of God. He presents it with the power that it has, undiluted, and he loves to present the truth of our time, the message for our time, or the present truth, if you like. He loves the word of God, and he loves also the God of the word. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, our presenter tonight is none other than evangelist Renzo Chitenge from Zambia. Evangelist, I want to invite you now that you may speak to us and the floor is yours. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. And welcome once again to the program tonight. Thank you, Brother Given for that wonderful introduction. I welcome you brothers and sisters, wherever you are around the world. I could see there are people watching us from the UK, people watching us from Morocco, Canada, and many other places around the world. We thank God indeed for this privilege that he has given us to meet again tonight for such a program as this one. Shall we pray together as we begin? Our Father in heaven, once again, we have come at your feet to learn more and more about your word. We pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray that may you guide us through your word, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, at the end of the message, may our hearts be touched. May our decisions be made to be drawn closer to the throne of God. Thank you once again and be with us even as we go into the word of God. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So indeed, brothers and sisters, as it has been mentioned already, the message for tonight is entitled Christ's Ministry in the Heavenly Sanctuary. This is a very big topic that can take a lot of time for us to discuss. I will endeavor to cut it a little bit so that it can be assimilated within the time that has been given to each one of us. Allow me to remind you what we discussed last time when I was on this platform, that ever since the fall of Satan, he has always had an argument against God. He has filed an argument against the creator of the universe. We read in early writings, page 145, and I'm going to read once again for the sake of those that did not join us when we, have the, when we had the topic 
a few days ago. The spirit of prophecy says, Satan was once an honored angel in heaven. Next to Christ, his countenance, like those of the other angels, was mild and expressive of happiness. His forehead was high and broad, showing great intellect. His form was perfect, his bearing noble and majestic. But we are told, when God said to his son, let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous of Jesus. He wished to be consulted concerning the formation of man. And because he was not, he was filled with envy, jealousy, and hatred. He desired to receive the highest honors in heaven next to God. So we see here Satan's agenda marshaled his army against God because he was full of envy and jealousy. He wished to be consulted with regards to the creation of human beings. Now, we learned last time that out of this jealousy, envy, that, and hatred that he had, he marshaled five arguments against God. And these are the arguments that he used to deceive one third of the angels in heaven. Number one, God is a respecter of persons. He has favorites. He argued to the angels that the Father gives Jesus a special treatment. And because of this, God is not what he is. Because of this, because of not being consulted in the heavenly council concerning creation, he convinced the other angels that God is a respecter of persons. Number two, he argued that God keeps secrets from us, even if it is our right to know. Why is the son the only one who can enter into the deep secrets of God? Are we not intelligent as he is? So this was one of the argument or argument number two. God keeps secrets. And number three, the law of God is restrictive of our liberties. It takes away our freedom and it is a yoke of bondage. If you allow me to be at the helm of control, if you marshal with me against the government of God, I will abolish these laws. Every one of you will have true freedom. And he began to insinuate or to plant doubts in the minds of the angels. Argument number four, beloved. He argued that God is selfish. All that he wants is that his creatures should obey him without any, with, without any conditions. He wants to render, or he wants us to render him service as slaves. He does not want even to help us. So, beloved, God is selfish was Satan's argument. And argument number five, God is not fair. He is the absolute justice. There is no mercy in his language. You transgress, you are killed or you are destroyed. There's no room for mercy. These were the arguments, brothers and sisters, that the devil marshaled against God. You can find them if you read in detail in the spirit of prophecy. Now, God knew that if this argument or these arguments are allowed to flourish, even the other angels will either be deceived into the works of Satan or they will be able to see me as a fair God. Remember, beloved, God had the option. He could have killed Satan there and then. But because Satan argued that there's no mess in God, there's no mercy in his government, God allows Satan to manifest himself so that the angels in heaven, even the unfallen worlds, can begin to see him in his true light. And that's why, like we discussed 
last time, because of having allowed him to rule over, having allowed him to manifest, beloved, even today, we can agree that none of us desires to be part and parcel of Satan himself. How then did God respond to these arguments? Remember, we are looking at the ministry of Jesus in the sanctuary above in heaven. How did God react to the arguments that Satan marshaled against him? Beloved, in order to do so, God brought in place to mankind and to the unfallen worlds, through mankind, a system that was to unmask or to undo, if you like, the five arguments of Satan. God unfolded, if you like, the plan of redemption so that bit by bit and step by step, mankind, the angels in heaven, including the unfallen world, could be able to see that indeed God is just. Indeed, God is not what the devil claims he is. This plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, was an answer to undo the arguments that, that Satan had marshaled against God. What was this plan of salvation? This plan of salvation, beloved, is brought into picture through message is much bigger. We have not much time to go through. So in short, God bling, brings a plan to rescue mankind out of this predicament that mankind had found himself in. How was he going to do it? Through the ministry of the sanctuary. Now, just a little bit. I want us to run through what were these very important portions, if you like, of the Old Testament sanctuary? This was an expose, if you like. This was an introduction of the plan of salvation that was to translate or to culminate into the coming of Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Number one, this sanctuary had a court. First of all, before the court, there was a camp outside the sanctuary. This was the place where Israelites dwelt. This was where Israelites, whose sins needed to be forgiven at the, at, 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 at the sanctuary itself. This is the place where animals were brought from. This is the place where Israelites, when they have committed any form of transgression, they needed to bring a lamb to the sanctuary. I will be a little bit slow to help each one of us to understand the topic for tonight. So number one, there was a camp where the lamb was taken from. There was a place where the Israelites were dwelling, and this was the camp. Number two, there was... A, a, a court altar or an altar of bent offering. When you are coming from the outside, you pass through the door into the court of the sanctuary. The first thing that was in front of you was the altar of bent offering. This is where the lambs were sacrificed. This is where the animals were killed and slaughtered, if you like, to 
to, to take away the sins of the victims of those that were involved in sin. After that, there was a liver or a basin that contained water where the high priest, before he enters into the sanctuary, he enters into the holy place or the most holy place. He needed to clean his feet. He needed to clean his hands. Then further on, there was a holy place. Inside the holy place, there was a table of showbread. There was seven branched candlesticks and also the altar of incense. Then beyond the altar of incense, there was a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. In short, every part of the sanctuary, brothers and sisters, that have been mentioned here, represented the various states that Christ was to minister as he proceeded to serve mankind. And as he did so, it was an answer to the five arguments that Satan leveled against him. So that when mankind and the unfallen world see how God is dealing the aspect of sin, they will be convinced that truly God is not a, a respecter of persons. God's law is full of justice and mercy. So these steps, the camp, the altar of burnt offering, the liver, the holy place, and the most holy place, these were the major components, if you like, of the sanctuary service that were depicting the ministry of Jesus step by step until such a time when sin was gotten rid of in Israel. In a nutshell, in case you have, you, you have been lost a little bit, every single day, whenever an Israelite sinned against God, he needed to pick a lamb from the court. He needed to pick a lamb, sorry, from the camp. This lamb was inspected by the priest to ensure that it was without any blame, to ensure that it was not blind or lame, representing that the coming of the lamb of God would be perfect. He wouldn't be blemished and he wouldn't have any fault at all as a perfect sacrifice. And then as a sinner brings the lamb into the court, the priest is waiting there. He confesses his sins on that lamb, symbolizing that I And his sins were transferred into this lamb's blood, which was taken and you know, sprinkled in the temple veil in the holy place. And then afterwards, that lamb was bent on that altar as a representation of a, a sinner whose sins have been taken away by that lamb. And then, beloved, there was what was called the daily service. Every single day, sins were confessed. Lambs were sacrificed on the altar every single day, and it was called the daily sacrifice. But there was a day at the end of the year when the temple is saturated or heavy with the various sins that were sprinkled through the blood of the veil. The temple needed to be offloaded of these sins that were accumulating. Therefore, a day was chosen. As you may know, it was a day of atonement. This day, the priest changed his garment. He put on a breastplate that contained 12 stones representing the entirety of Israel. Two lambs were chosen, lots were cast. One lamb was to represent the sins of Israel, finally that were to be taken into the most holy place, confessed off through the high priest. And then after the high priest finishes his ministry in the most holy place, he comes back out of the most holy place and he places his hands on this other God that was to represent, you know, to carry the sins of the Israelites from the sanctuary into this God, there into the wilderness, carried by a strong man who was to leave that God to die in the wilderness, symbolizing that one day in the time of atonement, 
in the sanctuary in heaven, there will be a transfer of sins from the heavenly sanctuary there into Satan himself, the other zeal, the instigator of our sins. And then finally, the work of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary will have been done and Jesus will leave the most holy place and come as the king of kings to restore everything anew. So in short, I was just trying to run you through every part of the sanctuary, the camp, the altar of burnt offering, the liver representing baptism or resurrection of Jesus, three, the, number four, the holy place where there was you know, the seven branched candlesticks, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the most holy place where the presence of God was found, the Ark of the Covenant with the covering cherub at each end of the Ark of the Covenant. In the middle was the mercy seat, the very presence of God, and right inside the box, which was the Ark, were the Ten Commandments, beloved friends. Now, Allow me now to mention this. We are getting into the lesson. We see now the picture of the Old Testament sanctuary acted upon by Jesus. Christ, when he came to this world, he came to become two things. Number one, he was represented by the lamb that was slaughtered at the court of the sanctuary. Number two, he was also represented as a priest or the high priest that was to stand for your sin and my sin in the heavenly sanctuary. So number one, these phases of the Old Testament sanctuary, they represented Christ's ministry in the plan of redemption. From phase one as a lamb in the camp to as the high priest in the most holy place. And remember, and I want you to notice, Every phase of Christ Jesus, as he fulfilled the Old Testament sanctuary mandate or responsibility, beloved, there was always a special announcement that Christ now has moved from phase one to phase two. Every time when Jesus changed his ministry from the camp to the altar of burnt offering as a lamb to sacrifice himself as a sin offering, there was an announcement. As Christ resurrected through the labor, resurrecting into the, into the holy place in heaven as the high priest, there was an announcement. As he entered from the holy place, earthly announcement of the heavenly ministry of Jesus Christ. And this is what we want to look at, brothers and sisters. I have said, in short, as Christ was fulfilling himself, the plan of the Old Testament sanctuary, every stage was sent an announcement by God through an individual or a group of people fired by the Holy Spirit to help people understand that Christ now has ceased from becoming an offering as a lamb on the altar of a you know, burnt offering. He has entered into the holy place as a high priest. There was an announcement. And this is what I want us to study, beloved friends. Number one, did Christ come into the camp to live as a lamb without blemish? Because, beloved, I don't think Christ, the first thing he would have done is quickly to go and die as a lamb of God without, first of all, being proven that he's the lamb without blemish. Remember, if you read with me Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, this is what the Bible says about the lamb that was to die. Follow me very carefully. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 12, reading verse 5, your lamb, which you get from the, from, from the camp, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the gods. So this lamb was to become or was to be without blemish. If you read in Leviticus chapter 21, what about the priest? What about the high priest? Because Christ 
came to fulfill two things. He was the lamb without blemish, but at the same time, he was to become the priest. When you read Leviticus chapter 21, verse 21, the Bible says about the priest who was to stand for the children of Israel. The Bible says in Leviticus 21, verse 21, no man, these were the sons of Aaron from the priesthood, no man that has blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come near to offer offerings of the Lord made by fire. So what have we learned? The lamb was to be without blemish. The priest was to be without blemish. Did Jesus live in the camp? Did he prove, brothers and sisters, to be the lamb without blemish? When you read the book of First Peter, the Bible says these words very clearly. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, talking about Jesus, having proven to be the lamb in the camp without blemish, for as much as you know that you were not bought or redeemed with corruptible things, as silver or gold from your vain conversation, received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So brothers and sisters, Christ was proven by his life from birth in Bethlehem until the time he began the ministry that his life was without blemish. Now, in order to announce that Christ has now come on the scene to prepare himself to die on the altar of burnt offering, which is the cross, there was an announcement. God sent a messenger to prepare Christ to announce to everyone that the one that you see here is not an ordinary man. He is here to prepare himself as the Lamb. When you read John chapter 1, verse 29, the Bible says these very precious words. I know this is a very familiar text. John chapter 1, verse 29. The Bible says these words. John chapter 1, verse 29. The Bible says, And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he said unto them, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Notice the language, beloved. Lamb taking away the sin of the world. This announcement by John the Baptist, sent by God, fired with the Holy Spirit, was God's heavenly announcement to earth that prepare for this man. He has come on a mission. He is the lamb of the Old Testament. He is the lamb without blemish. And he has come down to serve humanity. In short, Christ as the lamb without blemish is announced by a servant of God, John the Baptist, to prepare the masses to receive him as he begins the ministry. Remember what we have learned. Number one, every event of Christ was coupled with an announcement. The Lamb of God, before he goes to the altar of burnt offering at the cross, he is announced so that everyone sees him and prepares for his mission. One thing that, beloved, you should be able to understand, every announcement of the ministry of Christ was not received by the church established at that time with good feelings. They always received the message of the ministry of Jesus with mixed feelings. How did the Pharisees react, you know, when John the Baptist announced Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world? In Matthew chapter 11, this is what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 11, how did they receive this announcement? Verse 18, the Bible says, this is talking about how they looked at John. The Bible says, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said about him that he has a devil. So everyone that was sent by God through the Holy Spirit,
Spirit to announce the ministry change of Jesus Christ was received with mixed feelings. So number one, Christ is announced as a lamb without blemish by John the Baptist. What was the next stage? He's proven as the lamb of God without blemish. The next thing, he must go to the altar. He must go to the camp. He must go to the court where he should be sacrificed. And I strongly believe that this too should be announced that Christ, now that he is qualified to be the lamb without blemish, he is about to offer a sacrifice. Beloved friends, was it announced in Jerusalem that Christ, the King of Kings, Christ, the Lamb of God, is preparing himself to die on the altar? He is now transitioning, if you like, from the lamb that is gotten from the courtyard or gotten from the, from the camp. He has to come and be slaughtered. Was there an announcement? Yes. Read Matthew chapter 21, reading verse 1 to 10. This was the triumphal entry. The, the world must know that Christ is about to die. This was a few days before the crucifixion of Jesus. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. I'm going to read very quickly. Remember what we are looking at is every phase of the ministry of Jesus from the lamb in the, in the, in the camp to a lamb on the altar, to, the, to, to, the, to, to, to Jesus as a priest in the holy place, and in the most holy place was coupled with an announcement. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. The Bible says very quickly, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, they were come to Bethage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straight away you shall find a donkey tied. A coat and a coat upon her. Loose them and bring them even unto me. If any man ought asks you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And straight away they went. To cut the story, long story short, the donkeys are brought. Christ sits on them. All roads lead to Jerusalem. All roads lead to the temple where the altar is. Verse 8, the Bible says, And a very great multitude spread their garments on the way. Others cut down their branches from the trees and strode them you know, along the way. And the multitude that went before him, they followed and crying and cried, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 10, And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? Beloved, Jesus was transitioning from being a lamb out there. He now comes into the court. The world must know that he's about to die. The Holy Spirit moves the multitude. The children begin to sing. Jerusalem is brought to a standstill. Everyone must know that Jesus is changing his ministry from being a lamb to becoming you know, a sacrifice even on the altar. Beloved, as usual, like we've learned already, you know, this was not received by the church at that time with good news. They ridiculed and told, you know, even Jesus, who are these that are shouting? Jesus said, if they, if you do not do so, the rocks will cry out. What are we looking at? We are looking at the plan of salvation. Christ as the Lamb. He must change from just being a lamb, but he must die. Before he dies, the world should know that there is an activity that is taking place as Jesus changes office in the sanctuary pattern from being a lamb that was to be slain or a lamb without blemish to a lamb that must be slain. So, beloved friends, we see now Jesus dying on the cross. The prediction of the death of Jesus is mentioned in the Bible very clearly. A lamb shall be killed at twilight. A lamb shall be without blemish. All these things were pointing to the exact day, the exact time when Christ was to be sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. Answering the charge that the devil had leveled against God, that he has favorites. God has Jesus as his favorite. God was demonstrating to the world and fallen worlds and the angels, that not even his son could be spared. Not even his son, who the devil 
insinuated that he was a favorite, his very own son was left crying at the cross, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? And from that, the world saw that truly this is the magnitude of sin. Because he was a sinner, or a, because he was a sacrifice for sin, he needed to die, even if he was the son of God, to pay the penalty of the broken law. So what are we saying? An announcement that Christ is about to die as a lamb of God is given by the children, is given by the multitude. Jerusalem must know that Christ indeed must die. And we know the story very well. Christ indeed died, beloved friends. Now, he has resurrected, representing the liver. Remember after the altar of burnt offering, there was a liver before the, 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 before the, 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 the sanctuary, before the, the, the holy place. So Christ, after dying on the cross, representing the liver, Baptism, if we like, because baptism to us, we know we don't need to die physically. By the, 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 the liver, and then after we die, we must resurrect like Jesus Himself resurrected. And after His resurrection, now this is where it gets to be very important. Christ is moving, He's coming from the courtyard, He's coming out there as a lamb comes into the court, dies on the altar of burnt offering as a lamb without blemish for your sins and my sins. After he does so, he must resurrect. Now, between his death and the, and the holy place, Christ resurrects. And after he resurrects, he becomes a, a representative of you and me. Now that he has fulfilled on one hand as a lamb, his blood now becomes a means through which your sins must be forgiven. He resurrects and enters into heaven as a priest with his own blood that he shed in the court before the Father as he represents you. So we see him going and changing office from dying on the cross, resurrects, he goes to heaven as the priest standing for you and for me in the heavenly courts. Now, here is where it gets very interesting. Beloved, when you read Leviticus chapter 23, it tells you about the various feasts that were celebrated in the Hebrew calendar. The first feast was the feast of the Passover. It was a feast that represented the death of Jesus Christ. And this feast ended with the Passover with the death of Jesus on the preparation day, which is Friday today. Now, on the day that Jesus died, which is Friday, the next day was the Sabbath and he was to remain in the tomb. Meaning the second feast that was celebrated by the Hebrews, representing the, the office of Jesus, was the feast of the first fruits. Christ has died. And because he has died, the next thing after his death is his resurrection. But before he physically dies, these Hebrews should celebrate these feasts in preparation of his death and resurrection. If you read Leviticus chapter 23, I'm reading verse 9 very quickly. The Bible says, The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when you are come into the land which I give you, you shall reap the harvest. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest unto the priest. Verse 11, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morning after the Sabbath. And the priest shall wave. When you read down, this was the waving of the sheaf was after the Sabbath. When did Jesus remain in the tomb? It was on the Sabbath. He was in the grave. But the next day after him being on the, in the grave, the priest needed to lift the sheaf of barley. During this time, there was what was called the barley harvest. This barley harvest was the first harvest that was looking forward to the wheat harvest that was to come 50 days after the waving of the sheaf. So, beloved, after the Sabbath, 
the next day the priest picked a belly leaf or sheaf, waved it before the altar of God to signify that this belly is just a first fruit of the harvest that will come 50 days later. And 50 days later, they needed to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. If you read verse 15 of Leviticus chapter 23, the Bible says, And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, after the death of Jesus, after that Sabbath when Jesus died, you shall count from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. And 16, the Bible says, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days and you shall offer a new meat offering. 50 days from the waving of the sheep is the harvest of wheat, is the harvest and celebration of Pentecost. Listen, my brothers and sisters, I know this is a detailed topic, but listen, Christ has died on Friday. He remains in the tomb on the Sabbath day. The next day, like that sheaf of barley, he resurrected as the first fruit. Fruit of those that would resurrect even after the 50 days to the celebration of the day of Pentecost. Here is where it gets interesting. After Jesus resurrected, how many days did he remain on earth? Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, verse 2, that as if it's a coincidence, Jesus dwelt on earth for 40 days, beloved friends, as the Bible says. This, the Bible says in verse 3, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, and to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many unfallible proofs, being seen unto them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining the kingdom of God. Beloved, after the first fruit, after the resurrection, after the death of Jesus, you needed to count 50 days and the feast of Pentecost was to be celebrated. Is it a coincidence that after Jesus resurrected, he lived, he resurrected at the first fruit after resurrection, he lived upon the earth for 40 days. How many more days to reach 50 until the Pentecost celebration? Jesus lived 40 days on earth, resurrected, went to heaven. 10 more days were remaining. But yet he told them, do not leave Jerusalem. Gather together because within 10 days, the feast of Pentecost will be celebrated. After 10 days, beloved friends, what happened? There was a heavenly announcement. There was a heavenly announcement. There was an, sorry, an earthly announcement of a heavenly activity. And this was the day of Pentecost. Here again, Jesus, he's about to die on the altar of burnt offering. There is an announcement, Hosanna in the highest. The entire Jerusalem is on fire. Christ, after resurrection, 40 days, he explains to them and prepares them that from here, I'm going into heaven, changing office. Now I'm no longer a lamb because my blood was shed. I am going to be a priest representing you right there in heaven. But then there must be an earthly announcement. Beloved, on the day of Pentecost, on the day when Christ in heaven was received, inaugurated officially as the priest representing those that have accepted him, there was an announcement on earth. Jerusalem again was on fire. The Bible tells us when the Holy Spirit came, you know, each one of them began to speak in their various languages as those that were gathered were represented. Some were thinking they were drunk. But Peter explained to them, if you read his sermon in Acts chapter 2, do not think men and women of Galilee. Do not think that we are drunk with alcohol. This is just nine hours. We are here filled with the Holy Spirit because right here on earth, this is an earthly manifestation of the change of office of Christ Jesus. This is the 50th day 
from the day that he, he, he resurrected. It's a day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has come to announce to you that the one you crucified has entered as a priest for you in heaven as a priest to represent you. It's time to confess your sins. He's right now being dressed the garments of a priest as he represents you. There was an earthly announcement of a heavenly activity. Each time Jesus changes office from one level to the other, according to the pattern of the sanctuary, there was an earthly announcement of a heavenly activity. He enters now in the holy place to represent them so that his own blood can cover their sins. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, over 3,000 men and women gave their lives. We crucified an innocent savior. Right now, he's in the most holy place, pleading for my sins. I need to repent. So brothers and sisters, we see Christ entering in the holy place in heaven, announced by the door of Pentecost. Read Acts chapter 2. It was a sermon to explain, to say, it's not alcohol. It's not being drunk. God is simply saying, a priest is being inaugurated. And because even in the Old Testament priest, when a high priest or a priest was being anointed, they anointed him with oil. And as he was preparing to enter into the ministry, he, the oil slided down his body, down unto his garment, unto his foot. So the anointing of Christ as the priest in heaven culminated into the receiving of the oil of the Holy Spirit, even on the day of Pentecost. Yet again, beloved, if you read Acts chapter 4, this earthly announcement of the heavenly priesthood of Jesus was received with mixed feelings. Because each time Jesus enters a phase of judgment, enters a phase of a sanctuary portion, the church around that time do not agree with him. Revelation tells us in chapter 4, verse 5, he's moving amidst the candlesticks. He's moving, sending his Holy Spirit to the seven churches, representing his church down here on earth. But Jesus, will he remain in the holy place forever? There came a time, brothers and sisters, when Jesus, like the priest, needed to move from the holy place into the most holy place to perform the the the, the But Jesus needed to transition from the holy place into the most holy place. There needed to be again an announcement, earthly announcement of his heavenly change of ministry. Beloved friend, Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, God sends a prophet, Daniel, to announce a period of time from the time of Daniel until the end of time, to announce Jesus Christ and his ministry in the sanctuary. Unto 2,300 days, and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. What was the cleansing of the sanctuary? It was the change of affairs of Christ Jesus from the holy place to the most holy place. And beloved friends, we believe in 1844, at the end of the 2,300 days or years in Bible prophecy, Jesus himself changed his ministry from the holy place to the most holy place. How do we know that? The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. If you don't have time to read, please write these verses. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came 
the Bible says, came with the clouds of heaven and he came to the ancient of days in the Old Testament sanctuary, the Shekinah glory, the top of the Ark of the Covenant was the very presence of God. On the day of atonement, the high priest entered into the most holy place to appear in the presence of God. Daniel sees the Son of God transitioning from the holy place to appear before the ancient of days. And the Bible says they brought him near before him. Verse 14, and there was given unto him dominion and glory and the kingdom and all people and nations and languages that they should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. Christ is about to receive finally the kingdom. He appears before his father. This time again as a high priest, not with the blood of goats and bulls. His own blood that he shed on earth as the Lamb of God. That blood that you and I must confess. We need not carry lambs. We need not to carry goats to the temple. His own blood that he shed is the blood that you know, represents us. When we confess, yesterday I stopped. I do not want to live with this sin. That sin, my brother, that has held you captive, when you confess it, it's taken into the most holy place in heaven. Christ stands before the Father. Janet, James, Andrew have confessed their sins. Father, my blood stands for them right here in the most holy place. And we see Christ appearing before the Father in the heavenly sanctuary for you and for me, my brother. Now, what work did he begin? It was the work of investigative judgment. During the Old Testament sanctuary, brothers and sisters, when the high priest enters the most holy place, outside the court, Israelites are praying. They are saying, as the priest is in the most holy place, may my sins be forgiven. If I did not confess my sins, or if anybody did not confess their sins, Beloved, instantly, when the high priest leaves the most holy place, they would collapse dead. They would not proceed, <coughs> sorry, proceed in the wilderness to inherit Canaan. In short, the most holy place was to carry out, to list down names that were qualified by confession of the sins that they should proceed to inherit earthly Canaan. In the most holy place, Christ entered before the Father to do a final list of those that have confessed their sins completely and openly before God. So that when that is done, everyone is investigated. Their sins and my sins are investigated. And they have found that they confessed their sins before God. Then they are qualified to inherit the Canaan that is coming ahead of us. So Christ is in the most holy place. He appears before the Father. Many now us Israelites are confessing our sins before him. But to those whose sins are left, by the time he leaves the most holy place, they are found wanting. Now, as we come to the end of the program, I want you to see how does Christ before the Father in the most holy place investigate how does he investigate you and me whether or not we are qualified to inherit the kingdom of God through the confession of our sins Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 and 10 Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 and 10 the Bible says and I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garments was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like fiery flame, and his woes as burning fire. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued, and it came forth from before him. Thousands ministered before him. Thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set. The books, books were opened. Beloved, 
What was this judgment? This judgment was involving books. This judgment was to investigate in the books, in the records of heaven, concerning your life and my life, whether or not we are qualified to inherit the kingdom that Christ brings at the end of his ministry in the most holy place. Now, to announce that entrance into the most holy place of Christ, yet again, brothers and sisters, we are taught around 1830 and 1840, there arose an international and interdenominational movement described by historians as the Great Second Advent Movement. Around 1830, 1840, there was a movement that was looked as if these are lunatics, but yet they announced to the entire world the judgment of God is set. They thought that was going to be the end of the world. The world will come to an end, and there was massive revival. People prepared themselves for the coming of Jesus Christ, but yet there was a great disappointment. But after the great disappointment, there arose a group of people to re-examine the scriptures, and they found that 1844 was the year when Christ entered the most holy place. Beloved, in a nutshell, when Jesus entered the most holy place, it was a time to investigate the record books of your life and my life, whether or not we are qualified. In 1844, until the enactment of the National Sunday Law, is the investigation of the dead. Listen to what great controversy says about the record books in heaven. This is what the spirit of prophecy says. We are reading from Great Controversy, page 480. The books of record in heaven, in which the names and the deeds of men are registered to determine the decisions of the judgment. Says the prophet Daniel, the judgment was set and the books were opened. The revelator describing the same scene adds another book was opened in Revelation 20 verse 12, which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of the things that were written in those books. Beloved friends, Ellen White continues, when Christ entered the most holy place, it's to investigate. Did you know that your record and my record about your life and my life is under scrutiny in heaven? Did you know that you and I are assigned an angel who takes down every aspect about your life and my life, which shall be used as a basis for either or not that you should enter heaven or not? That is the basis God will look into as a means to verify whether you are qualified to enter into the kingdom to come. Listen to what Ellen White writes. I'm about to close. Every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, and every secret sin with every artful dissembling. Heaven sent warnings or reproofs neglected, wasted moments, and improved opportunities, the influence exerted for good or for evil, with its far-reaching results, are all chronicled by the recording angel. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, for every idle word that you speak, you shall be held accountable before God. Brothers and sisters, right now in heaven, there is a heavenly tribunal. Before the Father, Christ is finally compiling a list of men and women by virtue of their lives, compiling a final list of those that shall be qualified to enter into the kingdom that is to come. 
Remember the high priest in the most holy place before the Father, before the Shekinah glory. There came a time when he left the most holy place with the sins of Israel so that if anyone did not confess them, they remain with their sins. But all that confessed their sins, their sins were clustered, grouped together into the high priest. He comes out, finds the God and confesses them, representing Christ. When all the sins would have been confessed, he will leave the most holy place, bring all the sins before Satan, the instigator of them, so that himself, together with those that would not have confessed their sins, they shall perish. And he comes down from heaven as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. In short, brothers and sisters, there was once upon a time an earthly announcement of the transitioning of Jesus in 1844 from the holy place into the most holy place. As I'm speaking right now, the dead are being scrutinized. I don't know which name is coming. And beloved, like even in the time of Noah, as such is happening, as the record books are taking place and are investigated in heaven, you and I are not aware. I have no idea when my name shall come under scrutiny. When my name shall be called, it's not me to travel to heaven to go and answer. It's my angel that bears the record of my life that shall appear before the Father. Scrolling through, investigating, this brother was a sinner with such, such and sin. Even if he struggled with sin, he confessed and he was able to receive mercy. Grant him an opportunity to be part of those that will enter heaven. Activities in heaven are taking place, but yet on earth, it's business as usual. Beloved, you will not know when your name shall appear. This is not the time for business as usual. This is not the time, beloved, like Israelites. The moment they knew that the high priest has entered the most holy place, we know not when he's going to come out. Their duty was to confess their sins. Their duty is to cry out to God, is my name going to qualify? Beloved friends, those that are watching from around the world, Christ is doing his last phase of investigating your life and my life. Must I continue in the pleasures of this life? Must I continue in indecency right here on earth when in heaven his blood is representing you? Must you continue in indecency of relationships right here on earth when room is granted to repent of our sins. Just like on the day of Pentecost, they cried out when they heard he's in the holy place. They confessed and they were forgiven. We too must cry out, know that he's in the most holy place and confess our sins. My prayer, beloved, is that as mercy still lingers, as the door still hinges, open, it's time for us to sigh and cry. Lament for our sins. Lament and cry that our weaknesses must be overcome. Because when Christ leaves the most holy place, brother, there will be no room. You shall hear him pronouncing like Revelation says, he that is just, let him remain. probation closes. I don't know when my probation shall close, but one thing that I know, I have an opportunity to confess my sins so that his blood can cover me. During the time of Noah, when the door of the ark was closed, beloved, it was business as usual. Seven days after the close of probation, little did I know that the closing of the door was a pronouncement of judgment. They drank, they married, they married. It was normal for seven days. You won't know my sister. You won't know my brother that your probation has closed in heaven.
For now, while the mercy or mercy still lingers, open your heart to him. Submit and let your life be led by Christ Jesus. I pray that we take advantage of his ministry right now in heaven to confess our sins and give ourselves completely, letting go of all manner of sin that has held us captive. May God bless you as you think about this. We are living in the last days. The signs are clear. We never knew that we would be quarantined under COVID-19. This could be one of those signs that should help us realize that time is no longer. May God bless you as we pray together. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you that today we can see the signs of the time. It is telling us that when we begin to see these things, remember that the work of probation is closing in heaven. Confess your sin, my brother. Confess your sin, my sister. The signs of the times, they foretell that Christ is about to leave the most holy place. Thank you, Lord, for the message. May this not be a message of fear. Let it be a message of inspiration that we confess our sins while there's still time. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the children of God say amen and amen. Thank you and shalom. God bless you. Thank you. Um, wow, wow. That was powerful. Amen. And amen indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Evangelist, for speaking so mightly um, tonight. What a solemn uh, message that you have presented. And I have been edified. I have been challenged. I have been edified tonight and i hope that all of us who have been here effectively on this platform and those that have been following on facebook found a blessing from the preaching of god's word i pray that the lord will bless you evangelist that you may keep to proclaim god's word in our time and so as we close tonight i want to encourage all of us to be back here, same time, same platform. But let's also invite our friends that they may join us and receive the blessing night after night as we continue to air these series of hope, series of life on these platforms that we have um, been using. And so I want to thank also um, the technical team who have been helping us in the background, um, that everything runs smoothly. Thank you so much for your work uh, tonight. So to close off our session tonight, I'll ask that we bow and close in a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the timely warning, the message of hope, a solemn message that we have received tonight. We've searched our hearts, we present before you our shortcomings, our sins that we may, that we treasure, things that we have kept for long. We pray, Lord, that you may help us to break loose and let go, and that your blood may cleanse all of us. We pray, Lord, that as you are in the closing, closing pages of our life here, Father, we pray that you may keep us safe and keep us faithful until you come. We thank you for using your man servant. We pray that you may keep to bless, to bless him, give him good life, and that he may, you may sustain him, that you may keep to warn the world, to prepare the world of your coming. Thank you for being with us tonight. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brothers, sisters, friends who have joined us from different parts of the world. This will be it for tonight. We meet tomorrow, same time, same platform. Thank you very much.
Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. Redeemed by the blood.